Though Chamberlain tried to claim otherwise, it was increasingly clear throughout the 1930s that another war was fast approaching, and many were drawing up plans. The Railway Executive Committee reconvened in September 1938, consisting of a representative from each of the Big Four and one from London Transport. Officially, they were overseen by the Ministry of Transport, but in practice, they were run by LNER, the most powerful of the companies. Their headquarters was in a bunker built into the side of Down Street Station on the Piccadilly Line, now closed. A dividing wall was built into the end of the platform to allow high-profile visitors to enter without being noticed. They would ride to and from the station in the driver's cab. The committee spent the year drawing up careful action plans. As soon as the invasion of Poland began, they sprang into action, not even waiting for Britain to declare war. First on the agenda was to implement air raid precautions. Tape was placed across train windows to prevent the glass from shattering in a blast wave and the stations were blacked out to make a tougher target for the German bombers. Lights were also removed from carriages at first. Later, blackout curtains were placed across the windows to allow passengers to have lights on in the train. Within the same day, the committee implemented Operation Pied Piper, a scheme to evacuate the nation's children from the inner cities out into the relative safety of the countryside. And this was primarily handled by the railways. More than a million children were evacuated in the opening weeks of the war. Most children were sent off alone. They were lined up outside stations for local families to inspect and decide if there were any they wished to take in for the duration of the war. Not only were the children evacuated, but valuable artworks were moved to safe locations, and even the animals were evacuated from London Zoo. During the First World War, the rail companies had attempted to continue their peacetime services alongside the extra wartime traffic. This had created a very chaotic situation which had likely contributed to the disaster at Quintins Hill. Learning from this, the committee drew up clear plans for adjusting themselves for a wartime service. With extra traffic taking up space on the lines, average speeds would have to be reduced. This meant that the beloved high-speed expresses would have to take a back seat to the slower but heavier mixed traffic engines. Civilian passenger services were also reduced, with adjustments made to the carriages so that more people could fit on a single train. As with the First World War, troops gathered in their thousands at the stations for the railways to carry them off to war. But all too soon, they found themselves carrying the troops the other way. In June 1940, the main British and French force was surrounded at Dunkirk. 338,000 of them were evacuated to sea in Operation Dynamo. This left them awkwardly stranded on the south coast of England, and a need of returning to their barracks. The big four, between themselves, mobilised 327 engines to run thousands of special trains. Over the course of the evacuation, they moved 181,000 troops out of Kent and Sussex. Many of the troops had not eaten in several days, and so Southern organised rest stops along the tracks, where the trains would stop for eight minutes, while food and drink were passed up to the soldiers. With France now under occupation, it seemed to all that Britain would be next. The army rapidly sprung into gear, building defensive stop lines across the country, but particularly concentrated in the south of England. Due to its geographic location, Southern found themselves intricately involved in the invasion preparations, and this caused a dramatic change in their traffic. Before the war, freight trains had made up just 25% of their services. Now the figure rose to 60%, this left them badly short of specialised goods trains, and more would need to be developed fast. Southern's locomotive superintendent, Oliver Bullade, was in his element, pushing out designs for new or repurposed goods engines. Most notable of which was the Merchant Navy class, a mixed traffic engine capable of pulling 600 metric tonnes at 110 kilometres an hour. It was not without its flaws, however, Bullade installed his painted chain valve gear on the engine, which was kept in a special oil bath for lubrication. A fine design in theory, but the oil bath would often leak onto the tracks, creating wheel slips and even fires. 
but these problems were manageable, and the merchant navy's pulling power was invaluable for the military in setting up defences, and later in assembling troops for D-Day. As well as providing materials, the railways often formed a key component in many of the stop lines. Many of them were set up with railways to their back, to allow for rapid resupply and redeployment, and heavy railguns were deployed around the country. A series of special sidings were built into the tracks to act as firing positions, with the plan to move the gun to another position once the enemy had got a fix on it. Another measure that was taken to prepare for invasion was to remove or blank out road signs across the country, in the hope that invading armies would get lost, and rail signs were no exception. To aid confused travellers, the companies instructed anyone who knew where they were to inform anyone else in the carriage, but the invasion would never come. The only attack came from the air. Those sheltering from the Blitz could build an Anderson shelter in their back garden, or a Morrison shelter in their dining room. Either was free to pick up from the government, but to many, the shelters did not seem secure enough, and people took it upon themselves to create communal shelters in more secure locations. For Londoners, the tube represented a collection of tunnels deep beneath the surface, with convenient access points all over the city. They seemed ideal as shelters. Churchill, like many in the government, was resistant to the idea, believing that communal shelters would become communities in themselves, filled with people refusing to leave for work, as had happened in China. He also feared that the shelters would be recruiting grounds for subversive ideas. But Londoners took things into their own hands. They bought halfpenny tickets en masse, legally crowded into the stations before closing, and then refused to leave. And it was not worth the authorities' time to move them out. After three nights of this, the government made it official, allowing carefully regulated numbers into the stations every night. Over the course of the Blitz, the tube stations became increasingly elaborate, with bunk beds, toilets, catering, libraries, schools, entertainments, and even a limited train service to allow people to travel between shelters. At their height in September 1940, over 150,000 people a night were sleeping in the stations. The military too saw the value of the tube. Many of the command bunkers that were built in London were constructed with entrances leading into tube stations so that communications could be easily maintained even in an air raid. Of course, the tube was not always secure. In October 1940, a stray bomb hit the road above Ballam Station and penetrated deep into the ground before exploding. Not only did this bring part of the roof down, but it also burst a water pipe, causing the station to rapidly flood. 68 people were killed. Nor did the danger always come from the bombs. In June 1943, a crowd was making its way into Bethnal Green Station when an explosion went off not far away. This caused a mad rush to get underground. In the midst of this, somebody tripped in the escalators and others tripped over them, but the panicking people above continued to press in unaware of what was happening. In the end, 173 people were crushed to death. While people were sheltering in the tube, the service lines were drawing up their own procedures for dealing with air raids. As soon as the siren sounded, trains would stop at the next station and allow anyone off who wished to seek shelter. They would then proceed at no more than 50 kilometers an hour. The railways would also be used to fight back, rapidly deploying heavy flat guns to where they were needed. Once the raid was over, the railways would need to deal with damages. Around 10,000 bombs hit parts of the network throughout the war. Extra connections were built between lines, so that trains could be diverted where necessary. In particular, connections were built between rival companies, so they could share track where they needed to. Where trains couldn't be diverted, the track would be repaired as quickly and efficiently as possible, while replacement bus services were put in to fill the gap. The railways contributed to the war in some unexpected ways. When the government set up their main co-breaking station in 1939, one of the main reasons Bletchley Park was chosen as a site was due to it being roughly halfway along the main railway between Oxford and Cambridge, allowing the co-breakers good access to the intellectual talents of both cities. Throughout the war, the public were encouraged to dick for victory, 
setting up allotments on any free space they could find to compensate for the supplies lost to U-boats. It was pointed out that railway banks represented thousands of kilometres of unused land, and so terraces were built into many of them where food could be farmed, invaluable for many. As the war swung into the Allies' favour, defence turned to attack. As the Allies advanced across Western Europe, much of the rail infrastructure was devastated and needed to be rebuilt. The Allies imported tools and materials to rebuild the railways, along with a lot of their engines and rolling stock to replace the devastated French stock. In the final year of the war, exactly 1,000 locomotives were shipped across the channel, with the thousandth arriving on VE Day. The railways did surprisingly well out of the war. With petrol strictly rationed, much of the traffic the railways had lost in the previous decades came flooding back. For three of the big four, this was the only time they turned over a steady profit and this was in addition to the subsidies paid by the government for the stock being used for war work. As the war went on, the government took a more and more direct role in the running of the railways. The needs of the war effort required them to ensure that the Big Four would work closely together and pool their resources for victory. By the war's end, they felt less like four rival companies and more like a single entity with the government at the head. After the war, this would present them with an interesting opportunity. But that is a subject for next time. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to like, share and subscribe. And why not leave a comment to help the channel grow? I am currently working on part 14 of this series, which should be with you in the next couple of months. In the meantime, why not check out the rest of the series? Or have a look at my website for more examples of my artwork. See you soon!